10 people here in the room. Let's get started. We have a huge crowd tonight, 10 people here in the room at Panorama. And it looks like uh, 12 or 13 on Zoom. So this is setting a record. People must have wanted to get back to clinics. Thank you to Don Melnick for getting us set up here at Panorama so we can have this hybrid clinic. Thanks to Brian Ferris, who is in Wyoming as my technical support. And with fingers crossed, we got this all to go. And then Ron Hopkins, our presenter, came in from Edmonds and we tested it and it all worked. So now if it doesn't work, now you will understand that we did try. Ron's going to present for us about building an ON30 layout in a bedroom sized room. I think I got that right. Um, it's not actually a bedroom, but it's still uh, very applicable. ON30 is very popular with a number of people down here. This is a, a slightly updated version of the clinic that Ron gave to the National Narrow Gauge Convention about 10 days ago. So if you didn't get to see it there, you get a chance to see it now. So thank you, Ron. Um, any questions before we get started? Has everybody got everything working like they want it to work? I see heads nodding. Byron's got our, our recording going. So I'm gonna ask Ron to go ahead and share his screen and we'll start the presentation. Okay, can everybody hear me? Oh, here's that whole thing. Okay. Um, well, I appreciate the opportunity to brag about my layout a little bit and uh, to show you uh, how much you can do in a small space. Um, we've almost certainly all uh, thought at some time or another that we could benefit from more space for our layouts. Um, uh, certainly, I've felt that way, but uh, at this stage of my life, I'm uh, quite happy with a limited amount of space, and uh, I, I sincerely admire the large layouts, but I don't envy them, and um, I'm happy where I am. The uh, advantages of... Uh, disadvantages, excuse me, of a large layout are um, something that uh, you may not have thought about too much, but you can make a lot more progress on a small layout without heroic effort. Um, the maintenance requirements are not nearly as great. Time for more attention to detail and for me, it was important that I had time remaining for other non-railroad activities. I don't spend uh, 200 hours a week on my railroad. Um, so the Moclips and, and Becks Creek Railroad is uh, the name for my layout. And it's an example, I think, of a lot of uh, hobby fun that you can have in a fairly modest space. I'd like to tell you a little bit about the design and construction and show some photos. Um, I should say that it, it probably, if I've done this correctly, will seem a little more orderly than it really was in actual fact, but um, um, so be it. The story began uh, two decades ago when uh, I had a new grandson and I had recently switched to ON30, partly with the grandson as an excuse. And I was working on a simple four by eight, uh, including my grandson a little bit as the picture suggests, but I'm afraid I didn't tutor him very well. He didn't really turn into a model railroader, um, but it did get me uh, wanting more and acquiring uh, some designated space. Um, the uh, space that I had, finally determined for my layout was uh, this room. It's in a uh, ground floor between the garage and the main uh, part of the living area. Um, and I had to preserve, in fact, this uh, essential passageway. 
uh, but it's a, a 14 and a half foot by 11 foot uh, room approximately. And uh, so the effective size of my layout was going to be about 150 square feet. Uh, this is a fairly ordinary size room, though it's a little bit larger than typical bedrooms in a tract house. Um, but remember, I'm modeling in a fairly large uh, scale also. Um, the previous uh, experiences uh, with my modeling, I'm a lifelong modeler, had established uh, several planning guidelines. I knew for sure that I wanted to model a steam era. I have no interest at all in diesel trains. Um, I would have lots of structures because that's my favorite part of the hobby. Uh, I had already settled on narrow gauge ON30. I didn't think I wanted to duck under um, because uh, when I visited other layers with layouts with duck unders, I, I just knew it was going to get harder and harder and more and more uncomfortable. Um, so I wanted to avoid that. And I wanted interesting operational possibilities, although I'm not very interested in formal operations. So what I really mean is I just wanted some switching opportunities. Uh, <clears throat> then in addition to those uh, givens, I thought in addition, I probably would set it around 1940. Um, it um, would be freelance, but uh, with some kind of plausible basis in reality. I like to serve small towns. I didn't had much interest in modeling a big urban area. Um, I had in mind a point to point layout with some staging and uh, some logging or mining elements, some mountainous terrain. And I had done a lot of planning previously uh, in with 18 inch minimum radius and number four turnouts for HO scale. And um, I just carried that over to my thinking about uh, ON30. Um, you know, the track is the same size, and um, I I just uh, thought that I would use short equipment and tight tight uh, radius. So I I played around with uh, lots of different uh, ideas, but I didn't really seem to be getting anywhere until. Uh, about that time, uh, my family acquired a condo in Moclips. Moclips is uh, over here on the uh, coast of the Olympic Peninsula. It's only about, uh, I think, a little less than 75 miles from Olympia, just north of Ocean, north of Ocean Shores, about 15 miles. Uh, it's a tiny little village now. Uh, Fortuitously, um, the year that we bought our condo, uh, Moclips was selling it, celebrating its centennial. And um, there's a very nice museum in Moclips. And uh, the programming that they had uh, set up with uh, regard to the centennial revealed the railroad's interesting historical influence. Um, Turns out that in 1906, the Northern Pacific opened its most Western station in Moclips, and uh, that station, or that railroad, uh, brought uh, many tourists and served uh, numerous shingle mills and canneries in the Moclips area. Um, the old images from the museum, uh, I'm not, by the way, I'm not a historian, and I haven't really delved very deeply into this. I learned just a couple of weeks ago from Brian Ferris that there were some interesting things about the railroad history that I had never heard before. But uh, these old images from the museum really got my juices flowing. Uh, this was a, a weekend in early uh, 20th century and uh, these people all came to Moclips by train because the roads weren't very good. And uh, they're there for a holiday on the beach. Uh, and there are probably five times as many people in this photo as now live in Moclips. Um, this hotel was a 360-room hotel. Uh, and uh, you can see them out playing on the beach in their uh, beachwear. And they could shop on Pacific Avenue, which was a very lively place. Now there is one store in Moclips. Um, 
and uh, no no place you could buy anything other than a loaf of bread and a bottle of milk, really. Um, this is a, uh, the bottom photo here is a contemporary picture uh, looking down Pacific Avenue, this uh, important business street from about the same location as the original photo was shot, but uh, 100 years later or 120 years later. And the railroad also served uh, um, wine, wineries and uh, shingle mills. This uh, top photo is of uh, the, the predominant shingle mill in the area, although there were many small shingle mills. And uh, this bottom photo shows the Moclips River lined by the canneries, which were uh, very common in that area. Mostly uh, clams, I assume, but probably some salmon as well. Anyway, the upshot of these uh, of the stimulation from these photos was that I decided to make 1940 Moclips uh, the focus of my layout. And uh, of course, I needed to adjust the history to meet my uh, basic planning goals of an ON30 layout. Uh, this required a transition from standard to narrow gauge and uh, an interesting um, uh, operation uh, required that there be more uh, railroad presence and activity than, than uh, had been true historically. Um, uh, the choice of 1940 was important because that was a time when small towns like those I imagined for my layout could still thrive. Uh, you know, I grew up in a small town in the 40s and 50s and um, a, a town of 500 people could still be a, a totally independent retail area with grocery stores and uh, bars and gas stations and, and jobs. Um, it was also early enough to justify some older locomotives and vehicles and so forth. And I wanted uh, the depiction of Moclips and the surrounding area to seem plausible. So the changes that I uh, envisioned in my evolutionary uh, progress um, could reasonably have happened in the 35 years since the Northern Pacific arrived. So uh, that's how I justify a 1940. So this is my alternative history. Uh, within a few years after the Northern Pacific arrived, they really wanted out because the traffic hadn't been what they'd hoped and uh, tourist traffic was declining because the roads were improving and so forth. The Moclips leaders wanted to ensure continued rail service and to add economical expansion to new cedar sources. They were exhausting the cedar shingle sources around uh, the immediate area. So they acquired the Northern Pacific right away from Moclips to Hoquiam. And uh, <coughs> Hoquiam, by the way, is a city on the uh, Grays Harbor area. Um, it's the, um, the, the original source of the train from uh, two mole clips. And then uh, to save on equipment and expansion costs, the existing track was replaced with narrow gauge and uh, the railroad facilities and mole clips were expanded. This, of course, was to help me make the operation more interesting. And uh, the line was extended to a, a fic totally fictional village of Becks Creek, uh, a new source of cedar in the mid in the middle area of the uh, Olympic Peninsula. So this is the way I developed the plan. Uh, this is the part that probably uh, is actually a lot more orderly than uh, was true in fact. But the, uh, the uh, simple point-to-point -point concept of my layout uh, suggests a, a very simple uh, basis for the plan. This is Moclips out here on the coast. Uh, the train goes to Becks Creek and here in this circle area in the middle of the Olympic Peninsula, and it goes to Hoquiam, uh, the connection to the real world. This is a sketch of uh, Moclips uh, as it actually looked in uh, around 1906 when the station was opened. Um, and I wanted to maintain these critical features or these main features, but uh, with the kind of evolution that might have happened in 35 years. So uh, the station 
I had planned would be at the base of a Y and uh, the shingle mill, uh, the main shingle mill on my layout would be on the tail of the Y. Um, the canneries would be on the river uh, separating Moclips from the Quinault Reservation. Uh, this, by the way, is a contemporary photo of a cannery that still stands, although the photos, this photo is actually now a year or two old and that, um, that cannery has collapsed even much further since uh, in the last couple of years. Um, there was a trestle to, to the Quinault Reservation because uh, some cedar was being uh, harvested on the Quinault Reservation. And uh, these pilings are shown in contemporary photos of the crossing of the Moclips River just north of uh, Moclips. So the schematic uh, for these ideas started this way. I had Moclips at one end, Becks Creek at the other, and, I'm sorry, Hoquiam at one end, Becks Creek at the other, and the Moclips I knew was going to contain uh, the elements shown in the schematic. <clears throat> The uh, initial ideas for Becks Creek and Hoquiam, however, were more general. Uh, I knew, for example, in Becks Creek that I would at least want to run around track, uh, a turntable, and uh, a team track or siding for uh, loading cedar. And in Hoquiam, I knew that I would want some staging tracks and run around. In fact, in the beginning, I really just thought of Hoquiam as a staging yard. Adding these areas for Becks Creek uh, results in a schematic like this. And uh, then for Hoquiam, uh, a few tracks at the other end. So uh, the obvious possibility was bench work around three walls with uh, one of these uh, villages in each, uh, on each of the walls. Uh, but the Moclips uh, Y sort of begged a uh, uh, a peninsula, and uh, I'd like to get. I have on my screen something here I'd like to get rid of, but I don't know how. Sorry, anyway, on the top of my screen, I have some information from Zoom that I don't really want. And it's kind of in my way, but um, uh, one, uh, one problem was that um, I wanted the longest run possible between Moclips and Bex Creek. So that determined that I wanted to put them on opposite walls. And then finally, uh, Moclips is bordered on the north by the Quinault Reservation. Um, notice that uh, the uh, this the, the Pacific Ocean is out here to the top of this sketch. So uh, the north is uh, to the right, and um, so the track toward Becks Creek goes to an area that's kind of northeast of uh, Moclips, but it's going to have to leave Moclips headed in a southerly direction because uh, it can't, it didn't have access to the Quinault Reservation. Anyway, I decided on uh, this basic approach uh, schematized here. So I put Hoquiam with staging tracks in the middle and Becks Creek and Moclips at opposite ends. And uh, that, that may have been a bad decision, but it's, it's been interesting. Um, these are some ideas that I intend to incorporate or was thinking about incorporating that uh, were being considered in more detailed planning. In general, I wanted some hidden track between Moclips and Becks Creek. And I had been thinking about scenic barriers between the three main areas since I have such three, three such clearly defined areas in a small space. I thought maybe some uh, scenic barriers would be helpful. Um, 
For mow clips, I definitely wanted to add a small yard and some engine servicing facilities. And uh, then I thought every little town ought to have a team track and a freight house. And in um, mow clips, I wanted the, the uh, business flats uh, along Pacific Avenue behind the station. Bex Creek, uh, I wanted the minimum amount of uh, coal and water service for locomotives. Uh, I thought I would incorporate both logging and mining. I had a brewery kit that I really liked. I'll talk about it a little later uh, and hope to include um, some retail businesses and uh, a, a mountain stream, of course, because Bex Creek uh, is a mountain stream. And in Hoquiam, I was uh, originally only thinking in terms of staging tracks, period. But uh, the more I thought about it, the more I thought I would uh, landscape with warehouse flats and a wharf scene and some standard gauge interchange. I tested a lot of these ideas on paper and or the train room floor. Uh, <coughs> these I found these track templates and uh, cardboard structure footprints very useful in thinking. I guess I'm a visual thinker, but I, I like to lay things out and see how they fit in the closer to the real world than just on paper. In fact, these the track templates are uh, HO scale, uh, but that's fine for ON30. And uh, I've been using them for 50 years. Uh, I made them when I was a young uh, HO model, well, sort of young HO model, and uh, I found them many, many times useful over the years. And then uh, about this time in the fall of 2008, Model Railroader Magazine introduced a uh, contest, a uh, track planning contest. And uh, uh, Greg, can, can you see these control parameters at the top of the screen? Do you, do you see that in the way of the... No, like they're, they're, they're not showing... They're not visible to you? No. Okay, good. Well, I'd like to get rid of them. They're, they're annoying to me, but if they're not visible to you, that's okay. Um, so uh, this was the plan that I submitted to the MR contest, thinking, of course, that I had the most brilliant ideas any, anybody had ever um, realized. And... Uh, uh, I, I didn't, I not only didn't win anything, but I never even heard that they received my plan. Um, but the view blocks, uh, which were shown on this version of my thinking, uh, have become uh, concrete ideas. Uh, the Moclip scene was still developing. Uh, the Hoquiam treatment here uh, and the uh, hidden trackage uh, were kind of close to final. Um, I had at this stage of planning the idea that um, in Beck's Creek, logging would be represented by a log loading area here, by a brewery here, by a stamp mill here, all way too much for the available space. Uh, but the general shape of the bench work was pretty well established. One issue uh, was that I had planned uh, these two routes uh, leaving Moclips in that plan, that Model Railroad Magazine plan, um, appear to be headed to the same place. Uh, when in fact, one goes to Hope in this direction and the other goes to Becks Creek, clear out here. And um, I wanted to make them seem like they were going in different uh, possibly different directions. And so the idea I came up with was to have them cross over, diverge as much as I could given the limited space and cross over so that uh, the Hope Rim route went out along the coast and then back in uh, inland, whereas the Bex Creek route would go inland right away. So this was the plan at the start of construction. Moclips uh, incorporated uh, that crossover idea here, uh, added some uh, a team track, uh, more yard tracks, 
OQAM, I added a turntable, uh, standard gauge interchange represented by this little track here, uh, and a hidden passing track behind the warehouses. In Mex Creek, in Bex Creek, I dropped the stamp mill, um, added uh, a false tunnel into the wall, uh, which uh, took the track into directly into the forest for uh, the uh, cedar sources. And uh, then I still had the brewery showing in my thinking at that stage. But the changes continued in Bex Creek. I changed uh, the path of the creek. Now it doesn't uh, go into uh, the back of this wall. It, had, it turns the other direction. Uh, the, uh, I dropped the idea of the brewery, which is shown here in footprint. Uh, instead, uh, the, the um, log loading area had been moved in my thinking from, from around this track um, back to this corner, and uh, I rerouted the siding that uh, was to escape into the turntable, um, and I changed the area for log loading. Um, <clears throat> in Hoquiam, I made some major changes quite recently. Um, originally, there had this shows the uh, passing track on the back route between uh, Bex Creek and uh, Moclips. Uh, the regular sidings, the only runaround being uh, using making use of the turntable and uh, standard grade uh, interchange track here. Uh, but recently, I took out the uh, passing siding in the back because I wasn't using it and. Uh, added uh, in that process some width to the uh, front area in Hoquiam so I could add another uh, siding and a switchback. And I uh, shortened the standard gauge interchange, added uh, a crossover so that I'd have a runaround other than just the turntable. I like the idea of the turntable as a runaround, but uh, in practice, it ties up uh, many feet of storage track. And then I had the idea of a wharf down here in this corner uh, because Hoquiam is uh, on Grace Harbor and it is a, a, a shipping, a sea shipping area. Um, but uh, I decided to scrap that and uh, I'll just have a team track in this area. And so I'm re replacing, repairing the fascia. So this was the final plan. Um, it's uh, even with all the structures and details removed, it's still uh, kind of a, a spaghetti plan, but the, uh, the schematic clearly shows uh, the potential for uh, operations. Uh, well, in terms of building the layout, I started with uh, this uh, previous bedroom, and it had a large, uh, as a bedroom, it had a large window uh, as required by the code. I replaced that with this uh, fairly narrow casement. Um, the uh, greenery that's grown up behind this window is kind of serendipitous, uh, but uh, has been commented upon as providing a reasonable backdrop for that part of the layout. I uh, patched and painted the walls, replaced the carpet, uh, with linoleum, I installed uh, fluorescent lighting uh, after a clinic uh, where I learned a little bit about uh, how to estimate uh, the amount of lighting needed and so forth. I settled on uh, six two-tube fluorescent tubes, uh, a total of 35,000 lumens. Uh, it's worked out okay. It seemed awfully bright when I first uh, implemented it, uh, but as I've gotten used to it, if anything, it's not quite bright enough. Um, it, uh, of course, people would now use LEDs instead of fluorescence, uh, but if you do ever use L, uh, fluorescence, uh, my advice is don't scrimp on the fixtures. Um, I bought the cheap fixtures, uh, shop fixtures at uh, Home Depot because they had uh, pull chain switches on individual fixtures, and I thought that might be useful. Uh, but I had 
within a very short time, I had to replace all the ballasts because of uh, inconsistent operation. And um, then finally, I added this storage cabinet uh, along the uh, wall that's the passageway into the garage. It's a basic L girder framework, uh, bench work, uh, no legs except on the peninsula. Uh, these panels, by the way, are just uh, temporaries that were here at this stage of the of the uh, framing. The, the final framing didn't uh, leave any of those panels. Uh, the bench work is fairly high, 55 inches in Moclips and 58 in Bex Creek. Uh, uh, I, I did that because I wanted to have a workbench under under the layout, um, it's, but it's turned out to be a, a very nice height. I'm, I'm very happy with it. Uh, if anything, I might make it slightly higher next time. So disappoint, disappointment to the kids and to an occasional short spouse, but um, it's um, it's very convenient because near eye level and it, it um, just works out well. I used a track base of uh, plywood homosote sandwich, uh, most of which came from a previous layout. Uh, and I piecing together these awkwardly shaped chunks uh, led to some kind of mysterious uh, looking things in the interim, but it worked out mostly. Uh, in the Bex Creek area, I used a home bed on a plywood uh, platform. Track work is mostly hand laid, uh, code 70 rail. Um, here you see some of it in progress. And again, you can see the patchworky looking bench work. Um, I did uh, violate uh, this uh, hand laid principle some in the Hoquiam area and use some microengineering uh, flexible track. Uh, I used uh, fast tracks, number four turnouts, and I. Uh, Highly recommend the uh, fast tracks jigs, but uh, more importantly, I recommend the point and stock rail filing tools. If you if you're inclined to hand build, um, scratch build uh, turnouts, these uh, these uh, tools for the point filing and uh, stock and rail filing are just they're wonderful. Uh, and if you use the fast tracks jigs, don't throw away your track gauge because you need you need to check the track gauge. Um, the ballast uh, shown in this bottom photo is 50% sifted sand, 25% sanded grout, and 25% uh, woodland scenics medium cinders. Uh, it turned out pretty well. I'm pleased with it. I attached a mason, a face, mas, masonite fascia to the vertical supports and uh, just followed the contour of the base. Uh, I did not uh, square up the, the upper edge of the, I, I left it a little bit uh, joggy. These are the view blocks at the uh, two ends of the Hoquiam area. Um, and they're just uh, masonite uh, panel, masonite over framework panels. I have no backdrops. Um, I'm, I'm very happy with that. And I get a lot of comments about the way the light blue background sets off the, uh, the trees. Um, but uh, I, oh, it's another case where I admire people with photo backdrops. I just uh, don't didn't feel the need for them in my case, and I certainly didn't want a poorly painted, hand painted backdrop. Um, for the hills and mountains, I used uh, plaster cloth over stacked foam insulation. Um, Rock castings were applied uh, while the cloth was still, uh, while the, I'm sorry, while the castings were still flexible. And uh, I used dental plaster for these castings, stained them with uh, sprayed acrylic washes. The castings were actually made uh, from uh, rocks in my backyard. Uh, I made six or eight latex molds was all I needed uh, and probably could have gotten by with less. Um, and I used just two layers of woodland 
scenic latex, uh, one layer of gauze, two more layers of latex. Uh, I'd, I'd recommend more layers of latex, but my uh, my castings, my uh, molds held up fine um, with repeated use, and I could still use them again with no problem. Uh, my roads and uh, soil are sanded grout, uh, a hint from uh, Bob Brown, the editor of the Narrow Gauge Short Line Gazette. And uh, I'm pretty happy with it. Uh, I would probably have chosen a little bit browner color if I were starting over. And um, it is like cement. So uh, while it can be removed, you have to chip it away. It's not, uh, it's a pretty hard uh, finish. The trees, uh, coniferous trees, are uh, the Paul Scholes uh, version. Uh, that is balsa trunks, caspia branches, uh, sprinkled with ground foam. And the deciduous trees are uh, the common scenic express super trees sprinkled with uh, ground foam. <coughs> Stumps and logs are all rhododendron. We're fortunate in this part of the country to have a marvelous source of uh, very realistic log and stump looking material. The other vegetation I used uh, bushes and weeds, uh, of course, ground foam, sill floor grass tufts, uh, Martin Welberg weeds. I discovered these Martin Welberg things fairly recently. Others may be aware of them already, but they're the taller things here in this photo and in this photo. And uh, they, they're a really nice addition. Um, and I used a little bit of lichen, but not very much. I did find that uh, toy palm trees um, made pretty decent looking ferns. And I experimented with real ferns. Uh, this, at least this, excuse me. At least this one and uh, this one are real ferns. There probably are others in this picture. Um, it's a good idea to, leave them around for a while for the bugs to crawl out. And uh, although I didn't really see any bugs. Um, and then you do need to spray them with uh, green uh, floral paint because they, they'll they turn brown when they dry out. And the water for my streams and swampy areas is uh, a product called uh, Magic Water. I'm very happy with it. I have no idea whether it's still available. It's just a two-part resin. I'd assume it's not significantly different from a Virotex, uh, but um, it worked well. Here, where it climbs up on, on uh, the uh, surround um, is fine. I mean, it's, um, it's very common. I think all the two-part resin products do that. Uh, but mine happens to be in an area that's uh, affected by tides, and so it's uh, perfectly natural. My structures are uh, mostly craftsman kits. Uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> some, some craftsman kits, but mostly scratch built, uh, almost entirely of wood. Um, the scratch built uh, are usually. Uh, either stick built or just uh, some kind of siding applied over a gator foam core. Um, most of my structures have uh, interiors and the lighting. For operations, I have no formal operating scheme and uh, I just kind of implicitly assume a couple of mixed trains daily. I'm a lone operator and I actually run my trains very infrequently. I'm really a builder, not an operator. Uh, nevertheless, I uh, do appreciate uh, this track plans and other track plans opportunities for weight freight and switching. I do have uh, DCC. Uh, DC control probably would have been perfectly ad adequate for my uh, loan operator simple layout needs. But I got captivated by sound, and uh, so I switched early to the DCC and uh, using this NCE power cab. I like it, um, although actually I now find the so sound can get a little annoying. Well, let's take a look at some pictures of the finished layout. Um, 
In MOCLIPs, there are actually uh, four natural zones. Uh, the first is the shingle mill because it's the centerpiece of the layout and it's right in the middle of the room. Um, I wanted to capture the main features of this big shingle mill, the Smith shingle mill. Um, this is a 1915 photo and this is an air photo that I assume was about 1950. Um, Obviously, a large mill, way too large for me to model. So I just wanted to freelance the essential elements. Uh, those essential elements I determined were uh, several linked buildings, uh, steam power. You can see that, especially over here. A uh, log dump down on the Moclips River. Slash burner in the background. <coughs> Drying kilns, kilns, as exemplified by these... Uh, large chimneys, packing and shipping area, which is an area that changed quite a bit from the 1915 to the 1950 photo, and then uh, access via a low trestle or swamping area shown in this early photo. And uh, this is one view of uh, what I came up with, uh, several link buildings, uh, steam power, uh, I didn't want to, by the way, I didn't want to detail the entire interior of a shingle mill, uh, but I wanted some mechanical detail. And so I uh, put the power plant out here underneath a uh, open shed. And then there's the log dump into the Moclips River. Uh, a back view, backside view shows uh, the uh, drying kilns uh, represented by these large chimneys. There's actually a brick wall here, but you can hardly see it even uh, in the layout room itself. Uh, a uh, slash burner and uh, then the packing and shipping area and uh, some shingle bundles ready to be shipped out here on the dock. And another view looking across the front of the uh, mill from a different angle showing more of the machinery, uh, the uh, lifting engine and the uh, swivel engine, slew engine and the um, stiff-legged derrick are all uh, Crow River products kits, uh, much modified to uh, accommodate the situation. Uh, the uh, station area was, of course, the one that uh, I was particularly interested in kind of capturing the flavor from the early photos. And uh, this scene in particular uh, had been an important stimulus in my building the layout. It's just a colorized photo of the original station taken shortly after its opening. And the uh, Museum of the North Beach uh, was... Uh, intending a replica of the station as its future home and uh, had the original plans. So I constructed this model uh, with a weathered, uh, somewhat weathered uh, paint job and shingles to uh, uh, convey the 1940 image that I imagined. And um, these are the building flats that fronted on Pacific Avenue uh, and backed up to the rear of the station. So uh, this was the prototype scene in that photo from 1906. And this is uh, the uh, corresponding area of my uh, model in 1940. And uh, you can see that if I hadn't intervened, uh, the whole place was going downhill in a hurry. I think this picture was probably from the 1940s or the 1950s. And uh, uh, things were kind of run down. Uh, this is another scene showing the canneries uh, along the river. I had intended three canneries here, but uh, the view block on the station uh, was annoying to me, so I modeled a, uh, uh, a fallen down cannery. And uh, this is the team track and uh, freight house area. This is the uh, trestle that went across the Moclips River to the north toward the Cornell Reservation. Uh, most visitors assume that the trestle is under construction, but actually in 1940, it was being removed because there was no cedar being acquired uh, 
on the Cornell Reservation in my historical view. And here's kind of an overview of the station area. Uh, another zone of the Moclips uh, area is the uh, small yard and uh, engine servicing. Uh, this is looking down uh, from the peninsula end uh, of the yard. Um, this is a view across uh, the yard looking at the, uh, the coaling station and the uh, sanding uh, tower. Um, and this is uh, these two um, low trestles uh, across uh, our swampy area. Um, this is the backside of the uh, coaling tower and the sanding station. Um, the coaling tower uh, in prototype, um, and this is an old Westlowski plan from railroad model craftsman of a, you know, sometime in the mid eighties, I think. Um, and there was a pit uh, for the uh, coal reception. And uh, I had already had a, my uh, track laid and the base down. I didn't want to put in a pit. So I uh, conceived of the idea that uh, the coal would be dumped on this platform and shoveled into the lift uh, bucket uh, raised to the top of the tower. And this is looking at the other end of the yard engine servicing area, the uh, water tower, uh, engine house, and uh, blacksmith shop uh, with a little outdoor uh, storage shed. Um, this um, pump house uh, was an experiment uh, with individual bricks. Those are I don't know, I don't know the count, but there are a lot of individual individual bricks in that uh, little building, and it was. It was kind of fun and I think successful. I don't necessarily recommend it, but um, these uh, are the uh, engine house was uh, constructed from, um, well, it's scratch, but uh, the wall, the brick walls or the stone walls um, were taken from a uh, old uh, uh, passenger station kit and I think it was model masterpieces but I'm I'm not sure I'm kind of blocking on the on the name right now but I I butted together an end piece and a side piece for each of the sides of this engine house and then added some uh extra uh, areas to make it longer and uh, more open and the uh, actually the the um Blacksmith shop uh, is a uh, Stony Creek kit. And here's another view of uh, my scratch built logging caboose under repair in the, in the area. These buildings, both the, uh, this is the engine house uh, and uh, the blacksmith shop, uh, both have uh, lighting and interior detail. Uh, and it's actually partly visible in both of these cases because of large doors and so forth. So much interior detail is, doesn't, never gets seen. Um, uh, this is the area of the uh, departure from uh, Moclips uh, of the two, two routes. Um, I tried to take advantage of the landscape uh, terrain in, in the area. This is an old photo showing uh, where the uh, Northern Pacific turned inland. This is about three miles south of Moclips where it runs into another village, turns into another village uh, called Moclips. Prior to that, it has run down uh, this roadbed. This is a contemporary photo taken from the beach showing that you can still see the roadbed uh, where the uh, old Northern Pacific ran along here. Um, so I uh, planned uh, these bluffs uh, around uh, the track arrangement that I'd come up with and the uh, center piece, uh, the center area was too small for a pop-up or uh, uh, raise your head through in case of an emergency. So I made the center piece removable by uh, adding these uh, bowling ball finger grips. 
And this is the, the uh, final result. Uh, looking uh, from the station, uh, I've added the arrows and, and print for clarification. But to me, I'm satisfied that those two routes look like they go different uh, directions. The abandoned mine uh, in the background here is kind of an interesting story. Uh, this was a uh, HO scale Campbell kit for a, 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 Chama, mine, a Chama engine house, which I built in the 70s or 80s. I don't remember exactly when. Um, it was a nice, nice model. Um, but I had it in a little diorama uh, on a shelf below a stack of records that got dropped on it. And uh, so it was broken up pretty badly. And uh, uh, my wife advisedly would not let me throw it away. So uh, I saved it in a plastic bag and finally found an application for it. The smaller scale gives a little bit of uh, distance perspective and uh, it works fine as an abandoned mine. Uh, this uh, was the uh, lift engine uh, house underneath the uh, coal, the coaling station. Uh, the uh, truck, uh, these two vehicles are actually the two ends of the same vehicle. I believe it was a German staff car uh, that I found in the local hobby shop and uh, made a a um, flatbed truck out of one end and uh, buried the other, buried the rear end in, in the weeds. And this is a, so this is an overview of the Moclips area and it's essentially completed. The Bex Creek uh, scene also has uh, four zones. Uh, the first is uh, this area uh, where there's a creek uh, a curved trestle and uh, the area for transferring logs. Uh, the trestle I built at the bench uh, and it needed to be removable in the early stages so that I could build the scenery around it. Uh, and this was the uh, final result. And then uh, in the 1940s era that I'm modeling, I'm assuming that uh, while there was still a track into the forest through this tunnel and so forth, that most of the logs were arriving in uh, Beck's Creek via a uh, truck. And uh, there's a road that sneaks up uh, the hill a little bit behind uh, the general store here. Uh, and uh, they bring logs down to uh, this loading area. Uh, this uh, photo shows a more of a helicopter view of the uh, crane from a this is from a backwoods miniatures uh, truck. In fact, this may be the truck here. Uh, but anyway, the truck is now hauling logs, and this is the crane. Uh, and then this shows a clearer view of the bridge across Bex Creek and the tunnel into uh, nowhere. Um, down at the end of the creek here, there is a mirror that uh, shows the reflection of the uh, stream, and it is pretty effective, but you can't see it. Nobody can see it without a periscope and a steep ladder. Uh, the second area is the uh, downtown Bex Creek area. Um, here, there are several uh, kits involved. Uh, some scratch building, but several kits involved and uh, mostly lighted and detailed. Um, I always admired layouts that had the track, <coughs> some track running down uh, the middle of Main Street. And so that's a feature that I incorporated here. Uh, you can see the uh, details. Uh, you can't really Dis, dis, discriminate all the details, but you can see that there are details in these uh, uh, lighted windows. And uh, this is a nighttime uh, scene. Uh, then we move on to the freight house and team track area. And uh, this is a helicopter view showing uh, the uh, freight house and uh, a uh, 
field distributor. Um, a street level view of the same general area. And uh, these guys are unloading a new, fixing to deliver a new gas station, a new gas pump to the uh, gas station in Banks Creek. Um, and finally, there's an engine servicing area in uh, Banks Creek, um, which started with this uh, gallows turntable. Uh, I like the idea of a turntable with some uh, hillside uh, character um, and uh, walking path around it, um, a turning path around it. Um, the plan I found in uh, an ON30 annual, I had to shorten the table quite a bit to get it into this available space. Um, Here, the, uh, the coaling uh, platform is scratched, but the, uh, the actually the um, water tank was a, a Banta kit. Um, I added the, the plumbing and that sort of thing. Um, these two are both scratched. Uh, this was a fun little project from Model Railroad Magazine, I think. Uh, the uh, uh, the open sided uh, engine house or engine shed always appealed to me because you could throw some details in there and still expose an engine and so forth. Uh, I think I got a little heavier construction than I really wanted, but uh, it turned out all right. And I fussed for a long time what I was going to do with this hill behind uh, uh, the engine shelter. Um, I thought for a while it might be a heavily forested area. Then I thought because I got a compliment on the uh, coloring of the rocks, I thought maybe it should be a, a forest fire area. But I finally settled on just a uh, clear cut area with a, lot of, a rocky clear cut area with some stumps. And uh, this is the overall effect of that end of the layout. And this is an overall view of uh, Beck's Creek. The Hulk William scene is still under construction. Uh, these are three views, uh, progressive views, top to bottom, of different ways I thought of uh, for um, finishing the area. Um, I use a lot of mock-ups in my thinking and uh, simple mock-ups. I don't tend to... Uh, spend a lot of time making um, CAD drawn sides to paste on them and that sort of thing. But uh, it still helps me um, get a feeling for the, the flow of the space and the, uh, the uh, final object. And uh, the top here shows uh, pretty much where everything, where we are today. Uh, this end is pretty much finished and this end is pretty much finished. Uh, the middle is pretty much unfinished. Um, another view of the left end and a little bit enlarged view of the right end. Um, on the left end, uh, this is a scratch built uh, structure here with no uh, particular identity. Uh, this uh, is a uh, transfer and storage building that represents the interchange between the standard gauge and uh, the narrow gauge. Um, the uh, loading dock here was uh, a couple of layers of MDF laminated together, sprayed with uh, gray uh, concrete colored paint and then uh, scribed with uh, a uh, Dremel tool and uh, weathered a little bit. Uh, this building is, is just a uh, gator foam core with uh, siding uh, colored with pan pastels and applied uh, board by board. Uh, the rooftop details, interestingly, uh, are, I mean, effectively, I think, uh, are mostly from uh, 
ITOA, a uh, company that I don't know a lot about, but they do brick buildings and uh, these kinds of uh, details, HVAC and water tower and so forth. Um, the uh, lighting is Woodland Scenics. Uh, I forgot to add that the, uh, the, the brick modules here are the Woodland Scenics uh, modular pieces. Um, the uh, the uh, lighting um, is all the just plug uh, stuff, uh, which I, I found be uh, pretty useful. One very interesting hint that uh, Sam Swanson provided in a fire fine model, or Sam Swanson provided a hint in um, a clinic uh, a few years ago, uh, is to use um, leftover scraps of PC uh, coated uh, ties. Uh, copper coated PC ties uh, for making solder contacts with a very fine wire. I mean, the wires on these little things are um, uh, six thousandths of an inch, which is about a 35 gauge. They're really tiny wires. And the thought of twisting them together or hoping to uh, connect them with a uh, wire nut or even with the, um, even with their connectors is uh, sometimes hopeless and so being able to solder them effectively is a really useful technique. This uh, is the uh, headquarters of the mill clips in Bex Creek Railroad and um, also the uh, little passenger station and it uh, boards uh, butts up to uh, some more uh, woodland scenics brick modules. This, this sign I, uh, I made with, uh, I first put, uh, uh, glued up uh, a bunch of, of um, one by 10, two, I use, actually use two by, uh, two by eights or two by tens, uh, printed the sign on uh, just white paper uh, from my computer, uh, glued it on with white glue, uh, and then uh, scribed the, uh, boarding uh, the board separations with um, exacto and uh, sanded a little bit with a sanding stick on the paper and added some uh, pan pastel uh, tone from uh, some dark gray pan pastel very pleased with it and uh, this is the uh, area as lighted um, this shows that there was actually a, an interior. It's um, a mixture of, the, let's see, this cabinet and uh, this cabinet are uh, commercial parts. The chair, this easy chair is a commercial part that I couldn't find any other use for. So I put it in the passenger station, which is probably an unusual place for it. But the other pieces, the door, the uh, stairway, uh, the bench and the, um, uh, counter are all just scratch built from uh, various from wood um, but when it's lighted even up close uh, you really can't see very much now, one thing you might find interesting on your own layout if you ever uh, uh, get going on it is um, I, I labored about how to hide the kind of general idea that this is not only the entrance of tracks into the whole clean area but there's a crossing back there and some other things going on. And I labored with how to kind of conceal that. Thought maybe a long, originally thought maybe a long building over the over the tracks would, would do it. And eventually I just realized that just a little flat black paint hides it pretty nicely. The next project, uh, actually started in the uh, late 70s or early 80s when I built this HO scale uh, uh, brewery, uh, Campbell's models kit. Uh, and then uh, about 2005 or six or so, the Albert, uh, Mount Albert uh, Wood people came out with this uh, ON30 kit. 
uh, of a similar structure and I just really loved it. I uh, couldn't live without it, so I had to have it. I dreamed of a place for it on my layout, never could really find a place. So I finally uh, put the uh, the office part in as the post office in Becked Creek. Uh, you may remember it from earlier pictures and I'm using the uh, wall pieces of laser cut plywood for uh, a big uh, distributor kind of company here in uh, the Hoquiam area. For this uh, left-hand piece, I uh, closed off a couple of windows uh, from the front wall here. And uh, uh, then uh, attached them to this side wall, the back side wall. And uh, so that's uh, the result. Uh, Oh, I used, I filled in with um, just plain cardstock where I needed an extra um, wall. And uh, for the other piece, uh, I uh, used this wall and attached it to this wall. But in the process, I turned this wall inside out. I mean, the, at this stage, a piece of laser cut plywood doesn't know which side is which, so I just turned it inside out and allowed me to have the uh, the annex at the uh, opposite end. The reason I did that is because originally I can imagine this as a single business uh, with a common loading dock. I'm now thinking it might be two businesses, and so uh, uh, that may that may have not uh, gained me very much, but in any case, that's what I did, and this is uh, the result. And uh, that's uh, that's where I'm going to stop. I, I hope that uh, you found this interesting, and I certainly enjoyed presenting it. If you'd uh, like to come and see my layout, please contact me. Um, and uh, in the meantime, I'd be happy to answer questions or hear comments. Thank you, Ron. Thank you, Ron. Uh, we just got our, our microphone turned back on here. If you'll stop screen sharing, we'll give yeah. everybody else an opportunity to ask uh, some questions. Yeah. Can you hear us? I can hear you. Run, we're in awe. <laughs> Just speechless. <laughs> I know you couldn't hear us when, when you were presenting, but there were lots of, of uh, oohs and ahs. People really liked what you'd done. Well, good. Good. That's pleasing. I uh, got a lot of favorable comments in my open house, um, but I didn't. I saw Byron. Um, I don't remember seeing any of the rest of you at the open house, but if you'd like to come, just send me an email and we can arrange something. There we go. So uh, everybody's microphone is turned off. So if you want to ask a question to Ron, this would be the time to do it. Uh, but you got to turn your microphones back on. Uh, Jerry Barnes had a comment in the chat and I'm not sure what else here. Um, Paul Newhouse from Shelton says, nice and very interesting. Buckley says, thank you, Ron. Great scenery, structures, and details. Looking forward to seeing your layout again. Um, I lost the Jerry Barnes comment. So, Jerry, if you're out still there, um, you want to put that back? I don't know if you can hear me. I've had, been having problems. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. <laughs> I've been having problems all the time through the through the video. Uh, but uh, anyway, I have uh, my ON30 modules. I'd like to, uh, they're just sitting around not doing anything, just getting damaged. I'd like to sell, I got five of them, uh, or four of them that has tracks and everything on them, and they all work. They need some scenery on two of them. Then I have two modules that are, one's a transition module and a corner module. And I was asking $50 for the 
the modules that have track and switches and stuff off. There's probably more than fifty dollars worth of of switches and stuff on them if somebody wanted to take them and take it apart. Or uh, now the other two modules, uh, they just have a track on them, the corner and the, and the uh, transition module. And also, if anything, anybody like to come around and help me work on my SCL railroad, I got most everything to do. I've been working on it for a long time, but just uh, I just need the encouragement to for somebody to help help me keep going on it. And uh, I'm I don't have much energy and don't have much. Uh, I have a lot of medical problems, so I haven't been able to get out and do anything lately. So I, it'd be nice if I had somebody or anybody come around and help me whenever they'd like. Okay. That's the word. There's the word from Jerry. If you need his contact information, uh, you can email me and I can get you in contact with them because you should all have my contact information. I can't understand what you're saying, Greg. Um, I'm, I'm offering to be a kind of a go-between if somebody needs to get in contact with you because everybody should have my contact information. Oh, okay, I think I understand. I'm not quite understand. Quite sure. You're 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 not your screen's not too good either. I can hardly see you. Uh, we can turn the lights down in here. Oh well, no lights. <laughs> Anybody so, Jer have questions for Jerry or for, with, for Jerry or for Ron? Yeah, for for Jerry, I'm interested in those uh, Owen thirty modules. I can get through you, Greg. I'll get his information. Okay. Oh. Okay. Uh what, what do you need? My phone number is 360-456-0572. Uh, my email is jf-barnes at att not dead. Why don't you put those in the chat there if it's all right? That's good. So I had a question for Ron. Ron, that Mount Albert's uh, structure you built, was it HO or O scale you started with? Uh, the the one at the end of the presentation or the yeah, the, uh, yeah, yeah okay. the that was end. O scale O scale. Okay. I don't think Mount Albert ever did anything in in HO. I'm oh, not okay. Sure about that. Thank you. Yeah, I think they got their there's some connection between Mount Albert and Stony Creek, uh, and Stony Creek was an entirely O in or O scale uh, operation, and I believe the Mount Albert kits were all O scale too. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? Well, before we go here, I'm going to share my screen and talk about upcoming. So this is our a little bit better than tentative schedule. Most of these are confirmed for the Olympia clinics for 22 and 23. We use typically the third Friday night of the month. So on October 21st, per request, we have Jim Yonkins going to talk about backdrops. On November 18th, the um, OMRS, so the, the group here in Olympia, the formal club that meets at the county fairgrounds, uh, their, their president will be here. He'll do a Zoom presentation showing pictures of the layout. People get to see that and talk about what they're doing at the county fairgrounds and hopefully we'll get some of their members here in person for that. On December 16th, Scott Buckley will be talking about the great steam up that was down at the, the Nevada State Railroad Museum back in July. He and I got to go down and spend a lot of time riding steam engines and watching steam engines and touching steam engines. It was an incredible event. January, we typically have a dinner and a prototype presentation. So right now it's scheduled for January 20th. Um, Bob Butler will do it via Zoom from Arizona, talking about the Milwaukee Road that he worked for. We don't have all the details yet if we're gonna be able to do a dinner or not. And if we did, it might be on a Saturday instead of a Friday. So that one's still a little bit tentative. 
but that's what we have planned. Are you trying for Panorama? We would probably, yeah, we would do it here in Panorama, assuming the restaurant's up and running and able to host us like they did in the past. I'm working on that, so it's enough to... Yeah, and Don is the Panorama go-to guy. He is setting all this kind of stuff up. We appreciate that. February 17th, Chuck Ricketts was able to visit the Greeley Railroad Museum, and he's got a presentation on that he'd like to do. Um, that may also be our send-off for Chuck, depending on how things go for him. He's trying to move to New Mexico. His layout got sold during the Narrow Gauge Convention. Got sold to uh, Paul Oldenkamp, who lives in just north of Seattle, if, I, if I'm not mistaken. So that layout will get moved up there, so it won't go away. March 17th, or possibly uh, a week before or after that, Brian Ferris will be doing the NP Prairie Line. Brian's going to be doing a talk on the NP Prairie Line at the convention that's going to happen in May. It's the, I think it's the 150th anniversary of the Prairie Line, or is it the 100th anniversary? Brian can jump in on that one. 150. 150 years. So uh, Brian will talk about that for us. On April 21st, Rye Bates, easy weathering. And we're going to be trying something really different on that one. Um, we'll get the information out for anybody that wants to zoom into it so that you can have a freight car and the right products on hand so that Ryan can do the presentation. Um, he'll do it here live for the people that are live. But if you're watching, uh, hopefully you'll be able to copy what he's doing. That'll be the first time we've tried that. We're looking forward to that. On May 19th, Lee Bishop will talk about military railroad operations. He's got an article in a magazine right now about that. I've seen his pictures. They look great. We've seen Lee's pictures in the past. He does a really nice job. So we have that scheduled for May. And June, we don't have the date set yet because it's our Gophers event, which is typically on a Saturday, not a Friday. And we're going to go up and see Skip Hibbler and Jim... Sable, could you give us a little better description of what Skip has got up there? Sure. Uh, Skip is a uh, former Milwaukee Railroad uh, brakeman and conductor. Uh, he ran on most of the Milwaukee lines in West 